In the year 1980, on Wednesday the 9th of July at exactly 11.54 p.m., a little girl named Jody Ann Arias was born in the city of Salinas, California, and completely unbeknownst to her doting parents, was destined to become one of the most infamous people in the United States of America. From what we know about her behavioral sequences, and despite what her defense team would later want you to believe, there's virtually nothing in Jody's childhood that can be linked as a contributing factor to what she would eventually be capable of. The only thing worth mentioning was that she dropped out of high school in the 11th grade to pursue a career in photography, but it went nowhere. In February of 2006, at 26 years of age, she began a new job as a salesperson for a network marketing company called Prepaid Legal, and it was through this occupation where she crossed paths with fellow sales representative Travis Alexander, a 28-year-old practicing Mormon from Arizona, who also worked part-time as a motivational speaker. When you get someone to the briefing, they say no, that counts. When you get someone fully exposed and they say no, that counts. Every time you get one of those, cross one off the list. By the time the hundredth one's crossed off the list, you won't be able to spend the money. He was a very charismatic young man, which immediately caught Jody's attention. They met at a business conference in September of 2006 and began a curious relationship from that point forward. To cut a long story short, Jody was in love, and Travis was not. They broke up after just five months, but soon after the split, Jody moved from her grandparents' home in Wairica, California, into an apartment just two blocks from Travis's house in Mesa, Arizona. She was at that moment labeled the crazy stalker ex by all of Travis's friends, and although Travis agreed, he would continue having sex with her out of pure convenience. She would show up unannounced on countless occasions, sometimes in the middle of the night, and Travis would let her in every time. It became somewhat of a routine, and a dysfunctional situation that neither were happy with. Travis, although he enjoyed the sex, essentially wanted her out of his life, while Jody desperately wanted a serious relationship. And going off the myriad of entries in her diary, she firmly held on to the belief that they were meant to be together. In late May of 2008, however, she would ultimately have a change of heart. Travis had a work retreat planned to Cancun, Mexico for July 10th. It was all paid for by his employer and allowed him to take a friend with him. Jody knew about this, and believed, or at the very least hoped, that she would be the one going. Yet in the last week of May, it became known that Travis was taking another woman instead, a Mormon girl by the name of Mimi Hall, someone that Travis had been romantically interested in for some time. When Jody found out, it would be safe to assume that she was heartbroken. It would be even safer to assume that she was absolutely enraged, and the collective opinion is that a specific thought process began to emerge in her mind one that forged a psychological justification for a certain decision. On June 4th, 2008, six days before Travis was set to leave for Mexico, Jody would once more show up unannounced. All we know for sure is that they had sex and took explicit pictures of each other using Travis's new camera. At roughly 5 p.m., Travis would get in the shower and Jody would begin taking pictures of him using the same camera. Then, moments after this picture was taken, Jody would stab Travis a total of 27 times. She would also cut his throat and shoot him in the face. During the onslaught, Travis's camera took two accidental photographs. The first was taken as Jody dropped it during the onset of the attack. The second was taken as she kicked it by mistake while moving Travis's body. It showed Jody's foot and a fatally wounded or deceased Travis. The amount of time that passed from the two photographs was 62 seconds. Jody then spent an estimated 45 minutes cleaning down the crime scene to make sure none of her DNA was left behind. This included wiping down the victim's body with a cup of water and a cloth. She also deleted the pictures from Travis's camera before throwing it in the washing machine. She would then drive back out into the desert and leave Travis a voicemail for the purpose of placing herself away from the crime scene and giving herself an alibi. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits. So fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh. So I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to accompany us. 
Let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. End of message. Jody would then drive to another man's house in Utah by the name of Ryan Burns and stayed the night. He would later testify that nothing seemed off about Jody's behavior, only that they kissed and engaged in sexual intercourse. Travis's body was discovered by Mimi and her friends five days later, the day before they were supposed to leave to Cancun together. How long were you there trying to get into the house? Um, just, you know, a couple of minutes. I banged on the door, rang the doorbell over and over again. Nobody answered. I was, I was scared that something might be happening to him because I knew that he had a stalker. Travis's friend on the phone um, suggested that we go in through the garage and look for him in the house. And then as soon as they said that they saw blood, that there's blood everywhere, I stopped looking and said, he's dead, um, he's dead. And so immediately I called the police. After the news of Travis's death broke the following day, Jody called the police and offered to help with the investigation. She was then transferred to the lead detective, Esteban Flores, of the Mesa Police Department. The most notable detail of the phone call was that Jody agreed to provide a sample of her DNA. Over the following month, forensics were able to uncover the deleted photos from Travis's camera, and despite her best efforts, discovered Jody's DNA all over the crime scene. During this time, oblivious to the evidence that was building against her, Jody would post multiple pictures of her and Travis on Facebook, alongside emotional messages to Travis himself. She even sent his family flowers and a letter expressing her grief over his death. The Mesa Police Department launched their case against Jody on July 15th, 41 days after the murder. Detective Flores would be the one to conduct her interrogation. He had spoken with her once over the phone and was present when she was fingerprinted and swabbed for DNA. The Siskiyou County Police arrested Jody at her grandparents' house at 7.35 a.m. and only said they had a warrant for her arrest without giving further information. She was placed in handcuffs and didn't once ask what she was being arrested for in the six-minute drive to the local police station. What makes Jody Arias stand out among the many cases in the realm of true crime is the manner in which she attempts to navigate the system. She seems to believe that if she presents herself in a certain way and adopts a very specific character with very specific traits, it will give her the best chance at evading the consequences of her actions. In her mind, this character is a soft-spoken, sweet-natured, God-fearing individual yet to everyone else, is quite possibly the most universally annoying person to ever abide in the history of existence. In the next moment, Jody will hear Detective Flores approaching the room. She will then abruptly place her head on the table to make it appear as if she's sleeping. She will now notice the detective has instead walked past the room and then revert back to her regular sitting position. For whatever reason, Jody wants to appear as if she's in a far calmer state than she actually is. She wants the detective to believe that she's relaxed enough to doze off, when she is in fact extremely alert and anticipating his arrival. She places her head back on the table to feign a placid state once more, and you'll notice her left shoulder hovers in what looks like a very uncomfortable position for just over a minute. She then hears the external door open, at which point she takes a deep breath and then fully rests onto the table. Can I get those off you? Yeah. So you remember me? Of course I do. <clears throat> I traveled all the way up here to come talk to you. Because, well, you know, I've been working on Travis's case ever since it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know exactly when it happened, when he was killed. I know a lot of details. And just recently, we found quite a bit of evidence, and I'll discuss that with you. The main thing that I'm looking for, though, is answers. 
on why certain things happened, why they went so far, and also get your statements. Okay. <clears throat> um, She's been brought to a police station in handcuffs and now just told her arrest is concerning the death of her ex-lover. An innocent person sitting in her position would want immediate clarification as to what exactly is going on. Jody doesn't inquire further, just gently accepts to cooperate after being given a very vague, yet highly accusive clarification of the situation. A lot of details on this case that haven't been released to, to the public and not even to Travis's family. And those details are known only by us and the person who did it, okay? And, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is because I believe that you know some of these details. Okay. And I think you can help us. I would love to help you in any way that I can. Okay. Um, because we're here at the police department, the sheriff's department here in, uh, was it Siskiyou County? Siskiyou. That's what it's called, okay. Um, and you're considered uh, under arrest or detained, you're not free to go. And I'm a police officer, I have to read you your rights, okay? I'm sure you've heard them on TV, you, uh, you know, I have to read them off this little card here, but they're pretty much the same, and I'll explain them to you as we go, okay? And, uh, you know, if, if there's a question that you don't want to answer, you don't feel comfortable, you can say no, you know? And, or, you know, you can elaborate as much as you want. It, it's completely up to you. It's at your speed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pressure Is you. Is this recorded at all, or um, should we? I, mean, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, know if there's a recording or something. I don't know if these are voice recorders. I noticed them. If they have video they have audio or they're, batteries or what? I don't think they're on. Hindsight allows us to recognize this is simply an attempt to appear innocent. She seems to think that if she appears confident enough to recommend the use of an outdated voice recorder, that it will seem as though she has nothing to hide in the eyes of the detective. But it's just bizarre. If the detective wasn't already certain of Jody's guilt, he would most certainly become suspicious at this moment. Sorry, really cold. Okay. Still heat yeah, I haven't touched those or anything, but uh oh, okay. Um Jody's mind would be racing here, yet she desperately wants her exterior self to appear calm. She's so focused on having this nonchalant disposition that she completely fails to realize her behavior doesn't match the situation whatsoever. She's in a state of hyperarousal while feigning a state of composure, and the end result just looks very strange. It gives reason for her unusual infatuation with a voice recorder, and also for her oncoming sitting position which really can't be described, only compared to a sea lion peeking over a rock. And they're not on, so what I want to do is just get to the bottom of it. Everybody wants to know, okay? And, you know, so I'm going to ask you some questions. You can voluntarily answer them if you want, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Yeah, that's yes. fine. There was some question about you being, um, well, let's, let's start with this. What have you been up to since um, since Travis's death? What what have you been doing? Um. Well, I've been working. Mm -hmm. I haven't been really working in prepaid legal. There's not a whole lot um, here in this marketplace, which is it's kind of small here. It's small here, and really that sh that could be seen as an opportunity yeah. um, rather than um, a hindrance, because that just means the market is is untapped in a larger way. So I could have if I wanted to, but I have I'm kind of like a deer in the headlights when it comes to prepaid legal. And I kind of just have a fear of just approaching people. Mm -hmm. um, You'll come to notice that Jody will go off on these unrelated tangents anytime she has the slightest chance to do so. It's a recurring theme in interrogations for when the suspect is facing serious charges. And the common theory is that it's an attempt at gaining a momentary escape from what is likely the most terrifying moment of their life. Going into detail about topics completely unrelated to the situation at hand essentially delays the onset of their new reality. Forensic psychology views this as a form of denial. The detective subtly nudges her away from the theme of network marketing and onto the topic of Travis. She starts off with a Facebook post she made in his memory. I realized looking back on it that it was kind of, it kind of sounded immature. So it's more of like my dear Travis kind of letter. And so I took it down because... More personal? Yeah, some of it was details <clears throat> a little bit more personal. Not too personal, nothing inappropriate. Just, um, I just 
felt funny. I think because I'm a photographer, I tend to communicate more with the pictures, so I posted a ton of pictures that I had of him, um, and I have a ton more that I just can't access right now, and videos and things that I know his family would want. But um, She then explains how it's hard to talk about Travis's death with the guy she's now dating. And we've been talking a lot, and we try not to talk about that because it's kind of like, ugh. And plus, Travis is my ex-boyfriend, but at the same time, he's my friend. So while I'm mourning my friend, how do you talk to your new potential, possible, maybe, person that you might start dating about your friend, even though he was your ex-boyfriend? So it's kind of a gray area. The detective knows she'll happily trail off until the morning comes, so he cuts her off and locks her into the situation at hand. I have yeah, talked to a lot of people, and everybody's pointing a finger at you. You know, everybody is saying, I don't understand what happened to Travis. I don't know who killed him. But you need to look at Jody. And sometimes the simplest answers are the correct ones. One of the most fascinating parts of this interrogation is how long the detective allows Jody to cling on to hope. For the first 45 minutes, she will be terrified, yet still believe there's a chance she will be going home at the end of it. The detective will hint at her suspicions and culpability in a gradual manner, yet not directly accuse her until a much later stage. Dangling the idea of hope above someone's head while simultaneously hinting at the grim future that awaits them would perhaps be considered cruel in most other circumstances. Yet on this occasion, it is tolerated for a tactical purpose, which is to allow for as much divulgence from the suspect as possible. Her fear will cause her to panic, not enough to the point where she completely locks up, but just enough so that she continuously tries to claw at her own salvation, and in the process will divulge information that will be extremely damaging to her defense later on. And that's one of the reasons I started looking at you a little bit closer. And over the last month or so, I've, I've, I've gotten into Travis's life, talked to all his friends, his family, I got a really good understanding of who he is now. And I got a very good understanding of your relationship with him. Obviously you weren't boyfriend and girlfriend anymore, mm -hmm. but you were still having a sexual relationship, which, Does his know, family know about that? Just curious. No, just his family doesn't know anything. Okay. Yeah. I just, I'm, I'm interested in protecting his, mm -hmm. how he's remembered as well. and. Just for the purpose of integrated context, at Jody's trial, she would label Travis a sexual deviant, a domestic abuser, and a pedophile. He, he truly had feelings for you. And for some reason, he felt that the relationship between you and him was somewhat unhealthy, but he couldn't stop it. And I assume that's probably maybe the same way you felt about him, or... It's probably, Maybe you didn't understand why he didn't believe it was healthy. No, I, I didn't think it was healthy either, spiritually at least, and probably emotionally, but mostly spiritually. And I think that kind of, once you have something that's not healthy spiritually, it filters through all aspects of your life. Her dialogue alters from spirituality to her work history and then to her finances before moving on to her family. Bear in mind she wasn't asked about any of this. Financially, I wasn't doing well. I missed my family. I moved away. Um, shortly after high school and I come back to visit but I realize over the years I've missed out on a lot of things. My little brother and sister missed out on just uh, their karate or their baseball or cheerleading or the detective nudges her back to the subject of Travis once more. He asks if the sexual element combined with his religion was the reason the relationship didn't work. Jody then takes it upon herself to recount her sex life history and simultaneously preach about her own devotion to the Bible. I've, I've been, I've had a couple of serious relationships before where I was, where I was intimate with a few people. And it's kind of silly, but I used to always joke that, um, regardless of what the Bible says, and yes, I'm Christian, I just live my life by the Ten Commandments, and that's my, those are my rules, da 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 you know, thou shalt not this or that, but it doesn't say thou shalt not fornicate, so I just, I just used to joke about that. We did pray about it, I remember we knelt by his bed once, and, um, and surprisingly he suggested it. Normally, you know, we would, I would suggest that we pray before we go on a trip, or yeah. before we eat, if we're alone. That was kind of unusual for him, huh? Yeah, because he was very resistant to prayer. He's like, so I'd say, will you say a prayer? He's like, why don't you say a prayer? Um, why don't you say a prayer? Why don't you say a prayer? So we'd go back and forth. 
Jody, will you say a prayer? And I said, sure. And, and Travis was like, <laughs> The detective endures as much prayer talk as humanly possible before shifting the topic once more. He was at a point in his life where he wanted to really start settling down. He felt like he needed to kind of grow up, mm -hmm. you know, become a husband, become a father. Did you guys ever discuss possibly getting married or anything? Is when that... we were dating. We did. Okay. Once we broke up, he brought it up. He actually proposed to me a lot of times, but he wasn't serious. Um, Let's move to after the breakup. Oh, okay. What, uh, what kept you in Mesa at that point? I actually moved to Mesa a few weeks after we broke up. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a time period he really wasn't seeing anybody, and then Mimi came into the picture. Um, what did you think about her? And I didn't know a lot about her. She seems like a really nice girl. He showed me her picture on Facebook, you know. I don't think she had a lot of pictures on there. Um, he said that he's not sure why, but he's pretty sure that she could be it. Mm -hmm. And I was happy for him. Um, I didn't find out about Lisa. This conversation you had face-to-face -face with him? Or yeah. Or? yeah, it was in okay. his room. Um, and he had his laptop, you know, just on his bed. Um, Jody is desperately trying to make it appear as though her and Travis were on good terms. But this is just overkill. Jody was labeled the crazy stalker ex by all of Travis's friends, and even Travis himself. The idea that he would show and then discuss any potential future romances with Jody is ridiculous. And, and I truly believe he, he, he does love her still. Oh, he but does. He Travis had, had a, he's what you call a player. You know what that means. Yeah. yeah. He, he kind of... He doesn't pulls girls in. Though. He was reluctant to make a, a, a commitment first off. And truly, he didn't think that you were marriage material. And I don't know why not. I mean, I see you. You're 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 a wonderful girl. You're you know you're struggling. You're, you're trying to, to to make your way through life. And I don't see why you guys couldn't have made it. I think we're just, we have, we have very different philosophies mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, we would argue about the dumbest things, and like, there were so many times where I just couldn't wrap my mind around what he would, I could, but, but I tried to get him to do the same for me. Like, there was a time when I broke down on the way to L.A. once, and my, my car got a flat tire, so I had at the time roadside assistance because my car was still under warranty, and they, pulled, they went to take the car and to change the tire and realized that when they sold me the car, they didn't give me the wheel lock key. Um, and I was kind of hungry. It was dinner time. It was 7.38 and it was dark because it was January. Um, and the tow truck guy said, you know, there's a Denny's two blocks down here and there's a Jack in the Box there. And he was driving me to the motel. I said, is there an IHOP around? Because I really like IHOP. He's like, yeah, but it's kind of like five miles back in the other direction. I was like, yeah, okay. He's like, I can drive you there if you want. And I was like, he's like this short Mexican guy. and. He seemed really harmless, and I was like, uh, okay. And he, you know, and I asked him about his life, and he had a wife and kids, and so he wasn't flirting. The travels of Jody and the sweet Mexican continues on for another two minutes. The detective then brings Jody's attention to what he already believes was the trigger motive for the murder. So, you know, moving over to his trip to Cancun that he was going to, um, when did you first find out about that? That he was going with me. Oh, I didn't find. I found out about that at his memorial services on Monday. It was the Monday night memorial service. You didn't I, know he was taking me. I didn't know that. I think that's awesome, actually. Right. Yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, Mimi had called him a week or two before. And uh, I told him, look, if you want to take somebody else, it's fine, but I have something to tell you. I don't look at you that way. Mm -hmm. I don't look at you as a boyfriend. If you want to be friends, we can be friends. The detective essentially stated that Travis was friend-zoned by Mimi, but he still invited her instead of Jody anyway. What, what kept you to him? I don't understand. Well... Moving is expensive, for one. So once I was there, I was kind of stuck there. Um, but why was, do you continue to go back to him? You know what he wants. You know that it's not healthy. But yet you continue to go back. And it brings us to this point where we are now. Part of that, part of my um, perspective now has to do with the fact that I'm going through a repentance <coughs> process that I've worked out with 
you know, the, with my bishop. And he's given me, you know, certain scriptures to read and, and ponder and pray about. And Preacher Jody emerges for another two minutes going into detail about scriptures and baptisms. The detective then interjects and starts getting more confrontational with the facts about Jody's behavior towards Travis. And obviously you guys kept this relationship hidden from everybody else and, uh, because nobody really knew about it. Well, um, there were some people who, who I talked to and said, yeah, they continued to have a relationship even after they broke up. And there are others who, say, who are saying that you had become obsessive with him to the point to where you would uh, go into his house when he wasn't there or when you weren't invited. And, and he would talk to people saying, you know, she, she just kind of showed up and I don't want to tell her to leave, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want her here. Oh, there were a, that was yeah, must have been so. early on because yeah. there were a couple times when we established a rule early on. Mm -hmm. Just don't, you know, don't come over unless he said you can come over anytime, but I need to know first. The detective then starts ramping up the pressure and brings Jody's alibi and road trip into the discussion. Was it the week of the well, the first week of, of June? You took a trip to Salt Lake City. Which route did you take? From, from there. I was supposed to get on the 15 and go all the way up. Uh -huh. And I somehow got off the 15. Where did you end up? Um, for a while I was lost and I'm not above sleeping in the car so I slept for a while. Okay. I'm a heavy sleeper and I sleep a lot so. But you were on the 15 for a while mm -hmm. and you ended up getting off the 15 somewhere? Yeah, I, I, I looked at a map and I'm pretty sure I know where I went. I went, can I draw you a map? Sure. So this trip took you a little over 48 hours. And, um, I have a problem with this trip. Well, I okay. went first, too. Yeah, I know. Okay. I know you went down here. I've gone over this trip over and over in my mind and on paper. And even if there's still 20 some odd hours, even if you pulled over to sleep, a couple of times. Oh, did I tell you that I got stranded? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that. If you slept for 10 hours. I only slept for Here hours. and here, it would still leave 18 some odd hours for something else. Okay. This is what people are focusing on, is this trip that you took. Because they're saying she left, she didn't get to till Thursday. Wednesday, that's when Travis was killed. I did not go near his house, isn't there, aren't there? I pulled your cell records. Your cell phone was turned off between here and here. Well, I didn't turn it off physically, but it died. And then it magically, you, I you found your charger here? It was. I was under the, packed under the seat of the passenger side, and it was when I was... When you were lost, you couldn't have maybe pulled over and found it, or...? Well, I did finally start looking when I was stranded. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pulled over when I was lost. Detective Flores explains to Jody multiple times over how the trip doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And whether it's feigned naivety or that she literally doesn't understand the concept of time and distance, she pretends to be confused by the allegation rather than actually confront it. This goes on for three minutes before the detective confronts Jody with the evidence of the photographs on Travis's camera. But I don't think you're being completely honest with me about, about that trip. I honestly got lost. It's... It's bad timing. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, n I was nowhere near Mesa. I was nowhere near no. Phoenix. <sighs> I wasn't even close to him. Um, what if I could show you proof you were there? Okay. Would that change your mind? I wasn't there. You can be honest with me, Joey. I was not at Travis's house. Was not. You were at Travis's house. You guys had a sexual encounter, which there's pictures. And I know you know there's pictures because I have them. 
and I will show them to you. Okay? So, what I'm asking you is for you to be honest with me. I know you were there. Are you sure those pictures aren't from another time? Positive. Remember I told you about the camera? Mm -hmm. The card's intact. Remember I told you that card was destroyed? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell you the truth. And I have pictures of you in Travis's bedroom with Travis. Pictures of him. And it's obvious you guys are having sex. Taking photos of each other. And they're dated and time stamped on the day he died. Are you sure it's me? I mean, that because I Joe, was not there. It's you. And you know it's you. I know all the details of this case. The only thing I don't know is why. Why did you choose to go visit Travis that day? And why did you do what you did? I've never why, heard Joey? Travis. You did. You hurt him. That's why we're here. That's why I flew up here. Because I needed to talk to you about this. I can just arrest you and throw you in jail, but I want to know why. Why did you do this to him? I wouldn't hurt Travis. He's done so much for me. I know you took pictures of him in the shower just before he died. I don't think he would allow that. Mm -hmm. And the camera actually took a couple of photos by accident during the time that he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Joey, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. It's time for you to just come out and, I and didn't tell know. me. I didn't know. I did not hurt Travis. I did not hurt Travis. I wouldn't do that to him. The detective then goes on to explain the DNA evidence collected at the crime scene, which includes Jody's blood, Jody's blood mixed with Travis's blood, Jody's hair, and Jody's bloody palm print. You either had blood on your hand, and you touched the wall, or there was blood on the wall, and you touched the blood. Could my palm print have already been there and then touched it? Jody. Jody, this is over. This is absolutely over. You need to tell me the truth. Listen, the truth is I did not hurt Travis. If you want, I can show you some pictures of him. Do you want to see pictures of him? Part of me does and part of me doesn't. Why, because you don't want to remember? No, I Jody. just, there's a morbid curiosity. Jody. I wanted to know how he died. We can keep playing these games over and over again. I'm not going to believe you. Was it? I, it's over. Could it have been my blood from before? Your image is not important right now. Saving the rest of your life is... Listen, if I'm found guilty, I don't have a life. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. It just seems so impossible. I want to see it. I want to know. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not a murderer, but I guess if I were to do that, I would wear gloves or, you know, something. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. And I say, I did it. Mm -hmm. I mean. The motive is there. The jealousy issue. But I wasn't. I wouldn't even say it was jealous. I mean, there I mean, there may have been some jealousy there, but then what is I think it? if what anyone, caused this? I think if you know, if anyone, maybe Travis was jealous, but <clears throat> that's not what everybody else says. I can prove you were there. I can prove it. But what I don't have is I don't have answers on why it happened or. You know, maybe something just got out of hand. Just, maybe, 
maybe things get out of hand. Did you find the, the, the gun? Maybe that would... Joey, we're just playing games here. I'm going to take a little break, but I need you to think about what you're doing here. Because the best thing for you to do is to tell me the truth. It, it's so important that you tell me why this occurred, what was going through your mind, and what caused you to do this. I'll let you think about that. Okay? And I'm going to go look for some pictures, and I'll bring them over, and we'll continue this discussion. Okay? Let me go find them. I'll be right back. Tips, I'm not a murderer. showing you certain photos Please because don't some show of me. them are very bad. If Travis were here today, he would tell you that if it wasn't me. No. My job is to speak for Travis right now. And everything Travis is telling me is that Jody did this to me. Here's that one. Jody is then shown one of the pictures that was taken by accident while she was in the process of murdering Travis. It's your foot, Jody. These are your pants. No, it's off color because we had to enhance it and the color kind of changes a little bit. That's Travis. This is his bathroom. That is not my foot. Couldn't even recognize Travis. He'd been there so long. Do you have any recent cuts that are healing? Well, my cat scratches me. Little things. These are all her work. You can see. Mm -hmm. This is her. That's her. I've got scars. Okay. She's very. She's a feral cat. All these little things are her. Well, enough about your cat, but there's no doubt in my mind that you were the her. There's no doubt in my mind that you did this. None. So you can go and take your blue in the face and tell me you weren't there and you had nothing to do with it. I won't believe you. I want to know why. That's, it's killing me inside. I don't know why. Thing, like, there's no reason for it. There's no reason why. There's no reason I would ever want to hurt him. And I have a solid case against you. And I can present it to the judge as cold as it, is, as it is now. I don't know why she did it. Or I can present it to the judge with your explanation. If I found guilty, true. what happens? You don't have to pay the price. Well, what's the price? I don't know. Don't you know what the sentences are? The sentences that are carried for something? It depends like on your situation, how old you are, it depends on the type of crime. It depends on whether you show remorse or not. And part of that remorse is at least coming clean. When somebody doesn't come clean, I don't see any remorse. I know you're afraid, but you're already going through it right now. There's no backing up. 
There's no backing up to yesterday. There's no backing up to that day. It's already happened. And unfortunately, you're going to have to face the consequences. Um, you know, if, if I did that, I would I'd be fully ready to face the consequences. Um, I'm not really for things like, you know, I'm all for the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I didn't kill Travis. I just didn't. I did not take his life. You need to come out and tell me why this happened. I will not accept any other excuses. I will just move on with my investigation, with my final report, submitting all the conclusions and all the evidence. And we can just let that judge and the jury decide. We can leave it in the hands of the jury. What about the lie detector test? We can do that. That's fine. Would that help me at all? I mean, you can't use them in court, but... Well, then there's no point in taking it. I took a knife to him and couldn't stop. Couldn't stop. And before you knew it, it was all over. And then you panicked. And then you. I would, I've never been angry, that angry at him. Not enough for that. I've been so far angrier at other people, at other ex boyfriends. Then tell me who could have done this? <clears throat> who did this? I don't know, but if I am. If I go to trial for this, and if I'm convicted for this, whoever did this is going to be sitting very pretty somewhere. Glad that it wasn't them. And it's my job to make sure that an innocent person does not go to jail. But I don't see an innocent person sitting in front of me. Travis has done a lot for me, and I wouldn't hurt him. He introduced the gospel to me. Why is everybody saying that you are capable? of hurting him. Everybody says it. I don't know why anyone So don't tell me that you're not capable. I don't even hurt spiders. Oh, I kicked a dog once. I was a freshman in high school. And I love, love, love animals. And one, we had this dog, his name was Doggy Boy, and my parents, until this dog that they have now, have never been able to, and I don't mean just them, we as a family have never been able to care for a dog properly as far as give it attention and take it for walks and be consistent. To save you the oncoming ramble about Doggy Boy the dog, she lightly tapped him with her foot for tearing open the trash, and she's felt so bad ever since that it changed her entire worldview on the animal kingdom. She now apologizes to the dog, through the detective who's conducting her interrogation for first-degree murder. And I need to apologize for that to him. I know it sounds weird in my relationship with animals. It's kind of like they're like people too, you know, they have souls. What you need to do is you need to apologize to Travis. But you just refuse. Listen. Yeah, I can't help you anymore if you're not going to help yourself. You asked me really prior. can't. I can't, Jody. It's fascinating to observe how fast she can switch from one emotion to the next once she realizes a particular strategy hasn't worked. The attempt at elevating her character by expressing how much she cares for spiders and pets hasn't seemed to have any effect on the detective. So she then switches her disposition from sorrowful to analytical, as she once more tries to manipulate his perception of her. If I did anything that had anything to do with his death in any way... It's not if to me. I wouldn't... It's not if. It's not if at all. Well, to me it is. I would, I would be more than remorseful. Is it maybe something you're blocking out of your head? I don't think so. I mean, I tend to write everything down. I tend to... I just finished the book, The Road Less Traveled. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, the true definition of sanity is dedication to reality at all costs. Mm -hmm. Well, this is definitely reality. We are sitting here inside of an office, the sheriff's department, and you are facing first degree murder charges. What is and the difference? And you are going to be booked into jail, and eventually you will be brought back to Arizona, and you will stand trial. That's the reality. And once you realize that, I think you'll be better for it. I've had worse issues with other people. They're all still alive. 
I'm still friends with my ex-boyfriends. They're all still alive. You know, I've been doing this a long time. And there's one thing that I can never get out of my head. Ever since the first day I talked to you. It's, there's an old saying that, you know, someone's just not acting right. Look into it. You have not acted right from day one. You're just not acting right, Jody. You're acting like somebody who's guilty. How so? You tell me. I know because I've been doing it a long time. It's, it's taken me a long don't... time to, to figure it out. But within the first 30 seconds to a minute of a conversation, I can I know when somebody's acting right. There's a certain way people act. How did I act? Okay. It's not you like think? it's not like TV. It's not anything like that. It's not what you see in the movies. Is it because I'm not crying? No. Because I'm not because of that. What is it? I mean, I'm not going to change how I act. No, so obviously you can't change the way you're, at, you're no, acting. No, I mean, I am who I am. Okay, you're, you're sincere in the way you're acting. But, uh... Well, how is you're it... Just, you're just not telling the truth. How is it different? Well, it's not really something you need to focus on anymore. After Jody failed her attempts to extract inside knowledge on the best way to behave in order to appear innocent, she then attempts to explain why she hasn't been able to appear innocent. It's not that I'm not remorseful that he died. The reason I hesitate is because maybe this is something that's wrong with me psychologically, is I think of the butterfly effect. And it's like, you could say that the guy pumping gas station, get, pumping gas down at the gas station could have potentially, because you see all these movies, these funky movies, where it's like this affected this, which affected this, which affected this, well, if he had never done this. I know if you had never met him, you'd probably still be alive. That's true. Yeah, but that's because you killed him. No, I just can't admit to something that I didn't do, if it would help, if it would help my case and give me an easier sentence, I know that people plead guilty for those things. No, and I don't want you to do that. That is the absolute last thing I want. I wish that I had answers. I'm sorry. There's just no reason. There's just no reason. There's no good reason why this happened. There's never a good reason why somebody dies like this. This seems to be the moment Jody fully confronts the reality of her situation. The anguish she has over her own fate will become visible, yet she will now disguise this anguish as grief over Travis's death. She does this by posing a question. How many times was Travis stabbed? More than I want to remember. <laughs> And it's going to be up to the prosecutor to paint that picture. And if you want that prosecutor, and I've met him, and you don't want him painting that picture. I, I have to maintain my innocence. I can't admit to doing something that I haven't done. There's just no Well, reason. I have more work to do. Can you give me a rundown of what's going to happen from here when you leave? Yeah, you're, uh... Like, just today, for example? Well, you'll probably be taken across the street to the county jail. Uh, you'll be processed through there. Um, this is a really trivial question, and it's going to reveal how shallow I am. <laughs> but before they book me, can I clean myself up a little bit? You're going to be taken the way you are. I can't give you anything else. Do I have to go in handcuffs everywhere? Mm -hmm. It's just procedure. Whether you wrote a bad check or you're facing 
working charges, you're gonna go in handcuffs. Jody was then taken to the county jail and charged with the murder of Travis Alexander. She stayed there overnight and it would be a total of 16 hours before she was taken back to the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office. Her second interrogation commenced at approximately 9.30 a.m. Just remember in the winter Stand up for me. As I take these cuffs off, um, just go ahead and put your hands down at the waist, okay? The game plan for this second interrogation will be a lot more strategic. Investigators will have studied the footage the day prior and will now have a greater understanding of Jody's personality. The initial tactic is for Detective Blaney to criticize and berate the suspect's character while simultaneously reinforcing fear and apprehension. She makes it very clear from the offset that the suspect's fabricated naivety and sickly sweet persona will not work on this occasion and Jody's self-esteem will be broken down in a manner that would typically be considered bullying or abuse under different circumstances. This is done so that when Detective Flores returns, it will be a welcome relief, and an immediate rapport will then be attained, which in turn will make the suspect far more likely to cooperate. It's a derivative of good cop, bad cop, and the two investigators execute this technique in a near-perfect manner. Detective Blaney's time with the suspect is essentially a non-stop psychological onslaught, which is sometimes executed in a passive manner, while other times in a far more direct manner. During the latter stages of the bad cop procedure, Jody will be asked if she would prefer to speak with Detective Flores instead. This question is posed a total of five times, and only on the fifth time will Jody finally give in and admit that she would. This will give her the impression that when Detective Flores finally returns, it was all her doing, rather than a calculated and prearranged strategy. Okay. The voice recorder isn't actually for the purpose of recording the conversation. It is a prop to reinforce the perception of Detective Blaney being the enemy, and not to be trusted. You'll notice that when Detective Flores returns, this device will be switched off, therefore reinforcing the idea that he is the friend who can be trusted. Today's date is um, July 16th, and my name is Detective Rachel Blaney, um, and I'm here with Jody Arias. Is that how you say your last name? Arias. Okay, I'm sorry. This is just formality, um, and this is, you know, if, if I have to, you know, write up a report of, of what we talked about, at least I know word for word, you know, what you said, and there's no mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason that I wanted to talk with you this morning, <clears throat> there's a couple of reasons, actually. Let me say this. It's, it's obvious to me that, you know, you're not, um, uh, you're not our typical suspect. You know, you, you come from a, um, a good home, a good family. Your parents obviously care about you. Um, that was evident, you know, when they talked to him yesterday. Um, and you're a bright girl. Um, probably uh, more intelligent than you were letting on yesterday. And 
there's no question in my mind or any of the other investigators mind um, that you were the person that took Travis's life but what I need to know or what I'd like to know and give you the opportunity to do is determine whether you know you're a, a cold-blooded cold-hearted um, murderer who slaughtered this guy or are you somebody that got caught up in circumstances and things got out of control when this hits the news um, and, and it will it'll go to the media do you want to be portrayed as that cold-blooded cold-hearted murderer because it, the media loves that I'm trying to help you out I'm trying to give you a chance to, to make things right, you know, show the families that you do have some remorse. But when you continue to deny, 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 when it's obvious that, that that's not the case, you appear to be the cold-blooded killer. And things are going to start moving real fast here for you. This is kind of a pause. You know, before things you know start getting heavy, this is this is your opportunity to help yourself out. We don't need you to tell us anything. I'm doing this for you. It's a matter of do you want to take control of your situation and paint the picture of who you are? Because you're the only one that knows that. The professional ruthlessness of this investigator is quite astonishing. The demeaning and sarcastic tone she manages to superimpose over straight facts is gripping to witness. You know, was it a matter of, um, like I said, um, this guy, Travis, building some sort of what you thought was some sort of relationship, you know, where you were you hoping for marriage? Is this something that you were hoping for? Was he was he leading you down that path? Um, you know, did he take advantage of you? Um, was there were there promises made that um, were were broken? Did he betray your trust in some way? I don't know. Only you know that. This is this is not going to go away anytime soon for you, Jody. You know, you're a young, you're a young woman, um, just starting your life. You had a lot going for you. You should be fighting for yourself right now. And you let this eat at you. And it's going to destroy you. Or change you. In a way that you wouldn't want. Jody manages to veer off on trivial aspects of her and Travis's relationship that paint her in a positive light. Officer Blaney makes it very clear that she has far less patience than Officer Flores. With what appears to be a very sympathetic tone, she will snap the suspect's focus back to the element of the murder. As much as I love Travis, I just have always, there's something inside that says he's not the guy you're going to marry. So then what was it? What was it that, that led up to all of this? I mean, there's got to be something. So I honestly don't believe that, you know, that you're cold-hearted and you, you would just go and just, you know, kill somebody on a whim. That, that doesn't fit your profile. So what was it that, that led up to that? You know, you, you tell me. You tell them. You tell, you know, Travis's family. I'm just trying to fill in the, the holes there, you know, and just kind of guessing about the emotions. You know, what was it that would make you, you know, so angry or upset? Once Jody is forcefully brought back to reality, she all of a sudden has nothing to say. The passive yet disparaging tone of the detective must be a very hard thing for an individual to have to sit there and take, especially someone who has used their fabricated sweet nature to their advantage most of their life in order to avoid these types of situations. And if you're smart, you'll realize that, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of other chances to do this, probably none. Once the, the wheels start turning, they move real fast. And you will be out of control then. You know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person myself, and I, I don't think that I would want that 
you know, inside of me. I wouldn't want all of the, the ugliness of the lies inside of me. Take a minute just to think about what I said. Jody is clearly exhausted and terrified. She, at this moment, was being observed by both Detective Blaney and Detective Flores in another room, and they even contemplated having Detective Flores enter at this moment. They ultimately decided against it, however, and Detective Blaney re-enters the room to maximize this state of dejection. The pressure will now be increased to a considerable degree. Maybe I did have a wrong picture of you. You know, all of this time that you and I have been talking, and I got information from your other interview. You are talking about insignificant things at this point. You're talking about money, you're talking about material things, you're, you're talking about everything but... I'm just you're you talking about things about that just, people I care about. You're talking about everything but how bad you feel about Travis. You only respond to my questions if I were to Travis, I would be very remorseful. I think that I, I've gotten the wrong picture of you. I think that, you know, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe maybe you are that cold blooded person um, that they're trying to portray. And um, you know, I'm just really confused. I just at this point, you know, I, maybe you're right, maybe there isn't anything that you can do to help yourself. Um, you know, I Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you're not as intelligent as I thought you were. Maybe I was wrong. I don't know what else to, to do for you here, Jody. I'm kind of at the end of, of my rope. I was, <laughs> you're not gonna get a whole lot of people that are trying to help you out along the way um, beyond this point. And what I'm hearing is somebody who doesn't give a rip about what happened. I'm hearing somebody that's worried about money, your appearance, everything about you. I don't hear anything about Travis unless you're specifically asked. How do you think that looks? <clears throat> listen, I, it's, I don't care so much No, about you me. listen. You, you are not grasping the reality here, Jody. You are acting like the, the person that I portrayed, the ugly, cold-blooded murderer. Every time Jody breaks down, the detective immediately focuses on Travis's family. She makes it abundantly clear that she has absolutely no sympathy for the suspect despite her best efforts. I know Travis's family is struggling with why, and that would be the one thing that would give them closure. They may never like you, but I think that they would be appreciative of why their son's life was taken. I know if it was my child, that's what I would want. And I know that you're not a mother, but all women have those mothering instincts within them. And I think that you can understand that, what I'm saying. Was I off base, Jody? You're a very private person. Everybody has said that, and that's glaringly apparent. But all your business is going to be out in the open right now. So there's really nothing to hide from anymore. You know what I mean? And do you think at this point that your pride matters more than Travis's family's grief? <laughs> your chance to make at least something right even if it's on a small scale it's a big deal to his folks <sighs> this is your opportunity to make right on some of your selfishness I wasn't angry at Travis everyone keeps saying whoever did this was so angry then what were you
Were you jealous? Was he expecting you to come over that day? <laughs> he wanted me to. I told him I wasn't going to. So was it a surprise that you actually showed up? Jody prepares to set off on another tangent about photography, but gets shut down right away. The detective doesn't allow her thoughts to keep wandering off on something unrelated as a means for attaining a brief distraction from reality. I got pictures of him once shaving, and then he was already weird about that. Well, Jody, when you say things like that, it's obvious to me that you don't want to do the right thing for the family. You don't want to um, unburden yourself. You don't want to give them closure. Um, and you're jerking my chain. And I don't appreciate my chain being jerked. I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of skirting around it. I thought that it would be easier for you to talk to a woman, to say what you need to say to a woman. Sometimes it is. But unless you're willing to give me something, then I can't do anything for you. After today, things are going to go so fast for you, you're going to be totally out of control of the situation. the wheels of justice will start turning. I understand that you're afraid and that you're horrified uh, about that person within you that could do something like that, but it happened and it's a done deal and you did. At least you can do is tell the family how it happened so they can understand why. I mean, do you think you're gonna get this opportunity again to sit down and just have a free-form discussion? There's not going to be any situation or place that's going to make it any easier for you. This is as good as it gets for you right now. Would you rather talk to him? Um, if you do, you know, that's, that's fine, and I'm sure that he'd be willing to talk with you again. Or would you rather continue talking with me? It's up to you. Um, I, don't, I don't really have preference, I guess. I don't know what it is that's going on inside your head right now. I don't know whether you're weighing the odds, um, you know, trying to figure out how you can save your own skin here. Don't you think that it's going to make just a little bit of difference inside yourself as far as that closure goes, if you know that the family at least has something? And if you're not going to do that today with me right now, I'm just going to send you back across the street. because we've been in here for a while and I don't have, you know, the entire day. I guess my patients are running a little thin. And if you think you're feeling grief over this whole incident, think about how they feel. For once, think about somebody else. And if you want to talk to Detective Flores as opposed to me, you know, you can do that. It, like I said, I thought it would be easier for you to talk to a woman. I kind of do want to talk to him because he has been in contact with their fa with Travis's family a lot. Okay. I don't know if that would make any difference, but I know that he already talks to them on a regular basis. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, he has a, somewhat of a relationship with them. So I'll go see if he's... Yeah, I'm not trying to stall or anything, but I've got to go to the bathroom again. Can we go? Yeah. Hey. Well. Rachel called me and told me that you wanted to talk to me. Are you doing okay? It doesn't matter how I'm doing. It does to me. It Thank does. you, but it doesn't matter. What matters is how his family is doing. I told you yesterday I've been doing this for a long time, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, the, the person's family who, who was hurt, they're obviously hurting. But there's a second family that hurts as well. And in this case, it's your family. <laughs> the objective of good cop, bad cop seems to have worked. A higher level of trust and rapport seems to now be established. Jody pours out her emotion as the detective offers a sympathetic and understanding tone. But then something very interesting happens. Once she composes herself, she for some reason requests to see the photos of Travis. 
Not before, but after he was murdered. Many could think she is attempting to gain some sort of depraved satisfaction from seeing them. Yet going off how the rest of this interrogation plays out, it's more likely that she is trying to gather information, or at least confirm something in the photographs, before she amends her new narrative. This is a more of a selfish reason. I think it might give me some sense of closure. I know it's kind of morbid. I don't even think I really deserve closure. What is it you want to know about the photos? Do you want to see the room? Do you want to see the bathroom or do you want to see him or is it the photos before it happened that you want to see? I think the photos of after everything. I, I won't show you those. Are there, is there any that you can? No. I can't do that. We had a difficult time identifying who he was by the time we got there. And he wasn't the same person. So that's why I don't want to, want to show you photos. The detective attempts to get the dialogue flowing in a subtle manner, yet he's given the silent treatment any time he poses an incriminating question. Jody knows exactly what she can and can't say with respect to her own preservation. Her internal self is far more calculated than the naive exterior she continuously portrays. So why were you there that day? Please tell me. Did you just miss him? Should I be looking for somebody else? Was there anybody else with you besides you and Travis? Are you protecting somebody else? The detective allows for extended periods of silence. Only Jody will know for sure what she was thinking. Yet one could safely assume she is desperately constructing her new narrative during these moments. Trying to just figure it out. Just trying to think. What happened to me today and from here on out? If I just told you every single detail that I know, and I gave you a confession? Nothing else changes. It just speeds up the process. It's kind of, it's all really blurry. It really is blurry. It's all a blur. Can I please see those photos? Why did you throw the camera in the washing machine? We found blood in the downstairs bathroom where somebody had tried to wash their hands. There's blood on the outside of the washing machine. There's, there's little things that give us clues to what you were doing afterwards. Everybody says he just leaves his doors open when, he, when he's home. He trusts everybody. Um, have you ever seen the movie The Secret? I don't think so. This was the cue for Jody's next series of insufferable rambles. The detective valiantly endures this for the next 31 minutes to lower her guard. I used to go to sleep at night and I would hear gunshots. We weren't in a bad neighborhood, but our neighborhood neighbored another neighborhood that wasn't that great and gunshots carry. And there were, because Salinas is agricultural and there were a lot of fields and I used to think that there were hunters in the fields with their dogs. They were swinging by and pick up Amy. <laughs> I remember. And I wasn't there, I don't think. I was at work or something. I've never been in doubt, I've never been through the temple, but from what I understand, I think that's such a sacred place and, and meditating there and being there will help to give you further insight about where. There were three fears. One was handguns, which is one of the reasons I got a gun. There was a CHP here in town that said he would take me out and go target practicing. And I went to the sporting goods store several times to see what he had, and they were all in the five or $600 range for the kind that I wanted. So they were too expensive, but then there was this one, it was cheap. Jody's dialogue eventually winds up on the subject of Travis, and how Travis was private about the shower. The detective seizes the moment to catch Jody off guard. He subtly poses a highly incriminating question in a jokingly manner. He was very private about the shower, like we... Is that why you were taking pictures of him in the shower? No, <laughs> no. She doesn't deny she was there, only that she wasn't taking the pictures for that particular reason. She doesn't refute what is essentially an accusation, only a part of the context within it. 
This seems to be the moment where Jodi realizes the holes in her story are beyond repair. She has to admit she was at least at the scene of the crime, and will now start to scramble her thoughts to garner the most self-preserving storyline. Trying to get back at them. No, um... Did he say something to you? What did you do? Did you plan on doing that the whole time? I don't believe you planned it. Jody. Why not? Did someone catch you there? Someone not expecting you to be there? They want to see my car. Then who was it? I can tell you. I can tell you everything that I know or that I remember. Okay. What do you remember? Is there any way I can see those pictures? I just... No, not right now. Can I see them soon? I will... I mean, you need to start letting me know what happened. Okay. You're telling me that some other people were there. I don't remember him. If he, like, if this is his shower and the sink is over here, I was like right here taking pictures. And I don't really know what happened after that exactly, except I think he was shot. Where were you? Um, if this is his shower and he's sitting here, I was like, well, if this is his shower and he's sitting here, I was like right here on my knees and his bathtub is right here and I was taking him here and I was just going through the pictures and I heard this loud ring. And I don't really remember except Travis was screaming. I think I got knocked out, but I don't think it was that long. And there were two people there, and... What'd you say? Um... I remember putting my hand on his back, because he was on his, all four of his knees. He was like on his knees like this, doing something like this, or something like, I don't know. And I was like, I was like, are you, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? He's like, go get help, go get help. And I said, okay. And I turned around, there were two people there. One was a guy and one was a girl. I, I could, couldn't tell that at first, but I could just see one was a girl. And I assumed the other was a guy because they're billed and then their voices. Travis was screaming the whole time. He wasn't screaming like a girl, he was just like, like he was in pain, like he was like shocked, like, oh, you know. What happened, Jody? What did you see? <laughs> I took it out like a little bitch. <laughs> I ran. He was still, what? conscious and still alive and um, you just left him there no I, I ran into the closet and he stopped me and he didn't touch me he was just held the gun to my head and he was like you don't go anywhere and he told he told the other girl to finish it I didn't see he told me to stay there and not to move and where was that in the closet no it was um 
She describes that the male stopped her from leaving, and then goes into detail about how her phone wasn't charged and how she forgot her phone charger. She then describes how she valiantly tried to save Travis from the female attacker. She was over him, and I just rushed her and I pushed her. In the next moment, she will state that the assailant comes back when she never went anywhere to begin with. Um, I, I got Travis and he wasn't like standing up really. He wasn't really doing much and I was, and he was, I was trying to get him and she came back. I got him kind of far, like right here. She came back. He was starting to just get weaker and weaker. And this guy came back in. And she said that, um, she said that they, they needed to, um, do me too, because, um, because I was there. And he's like, no, that's not why we're here. From what you're telling me, she was the aggressive one and he was the more passive. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a aggression as far as, I mean, I don't know what you define aggression by, but like, I was, there was a definitely a sternness. So it seemed like they knew him, obviously. Yeah, but he didn't seem to know them. I mean, he was a little out of it, plus they had masks on anyway, but he didn't express any kind of recognition. I could talk. The detective takes her back to the moment she tried to save Travis from the female attacker. Um, so I wasn't sure, I just knew I had to hold on to her hands because she had a knife. What hand did she have? She, she had it in this hand, but well, her, her right, I guess. So. Her right. I just said, come on, come on. You know, he was naked, but I didn't care. Just come on. And he's like, I can't. I said, come on, he's like, I can't feel my legs. Jody had obviously seen a lot of bad movies. Bear in mind, this conversation she had with Travis was supposedly happening as she was simultaneously fighting off a knife-wielding attacker. She glosses over the struggle, and she somehow ends up outside the bathroom. The two assailants are now inside the bathroom, arguing with each other about Jody's fate. She hasn't stated whether Travis is alive or dead at this point. It wasn't like super yelling, it was kind of like hushed, but mm -hmm. intense. Like, you need to da 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 shut up, it's not over here. Things like that. The male assailant then takes Jody's registration out of her wallet and looks at her address. He said, if you ever, ever, ever say anything about this, so they'll do to my family the same way and me. And I didn't care so much about me at that point. He said, you need to leave. And don't you call anybody. And don't you say anything. He's all, I'm giving you one chance. And she said, she's gonna rat us off. She's gonna say something. And he was like, shut up. He was like, you get one chance. Jody then leaves in her car. She of course doesn't mention the fact that she then left Travis a voicemail to give herself an alibi for not being there. I was really scared. Okay. I was really freaked out of my mind. Okay. I don't believe you. I came in here hoping that you would tell me the truth. And this is not the truth, Jody. This is all I know. This is, does not make any sense. I feel responsible because I feel that I could have done more. I feel that I should have gotten help. I feel that I should have been stronger. You feel responsible because you did this. I did not. Joni, you did it. You did it. And there's nothing you can say that will change my mind at this point. This is an elaborate story, which does not make any sense. I've done this for a long time. And this is the most far-fetched story I've ever heard. And it's not gonna help you. Is that how you wanna leave this? I just don't want my family to hurt. There is a reason why you did this, and you just refused to tell me why. Maybe because you are cold. 
There's no reason somebody else would come in and do this to him. There's no motive whatsoever. I haven't found any. What is my motive? Jealousy, anger, fear. If you're being alone, angry at him for not keeping you in his life. I don't know. That's why I'm trying to figure it out. There are so many motives with you. Too many. Jody continues to give random details about the fictional assailants for a further eight minutes without being asked. The detective then ends the interrogation. One was male, one was female. They were taller than me. Not by a whole lot. Okay. Are you ready to go back? Um, yeah, I guess I'd still like to say something to his family, but... I don't think I have anything that could bring them comfort. Okay. Maybe I could write them a letter. Even as the detective is leaving the room, Jody attempts to add further credibility to the new narrative and gives more details of the two attackers. I can give you the So many inconsistencies that I don't even want to deal with right now. Okay, I just don't want okay. my family to get hurt. Okay. They won't get hurt. You're hurting them right now by not telling me the truth. That's what you're doing. Okay? Detective Blaney comes back with a pen and paper three minutes later. She was curious to see what Jody would write to Travis's family. It ended up being a self-serving and whimsical paragraph about how sorry she was that she couldn't save Travis. The family were never given the letter. Jody completely dissects and carefully examines the ham and cheese sandwich before she eats any of it. And as you've probably guessed by now, continues to behave in a rather unusual manner. a great traveling companion for many reasons. Um, traveling with Travis was kind of like traveling with your own personal comedian <laughs> and our serenader. Jody not only stuck with her story about the assassination squad, she doubled down and agreed to every media request that came her way. She also stuck with a soft-spoken, sweet-natured, Jesus-loving character that wouldn't hurt spiders, let alone human beings. But she once again fails to realize this fake disposition doesn't match the situation whatsoever. If you were sitting in a squalid jail, wrongfully accused of murder, and as a result facing life in prison or even the death penalty, you wouldn't be acting like this. She's trying to come across as the innocent girl next door, but she just looks like a terrifying lunatic. To know that he was stabbed some 27 times and shot once in that left cheek, who could have done this to him? I don't know. Who do you think killed him? I have no idea. Jody, you're pretty calm sitting here. How are you managing to stay so calm? Through my faith and through the knowledge of my own innocence. That's the only thing. Um, I would be shaking in my boots right now if, if I had to answer to God for such a heinous crime. Jody Arias killed Travis Alexander. There is no question about it. This is Jody's defense team, and what you just saw was the very beginning of their opening statement on the first day of her trial. The date is January 2nd, 2013, exactly four years, six months, and two days after Travis was murdered. The million dollar question is what would have forced her to do it? They must have figured the assassination story wouldn't go down well with a jury, especially when confronted with the many steps Jody took to get away with the murder. So the narrative has now changed for a third time, and the defense have to come up with a plausible explanation for Jody's trail of deception. The hole she had dug herself into was exceptionally deep, and her attorneys are now crafting the rope to pull her out. Jody did not always tell the truth about what happened that night. She was scared. 
scared about what had happened and scared about what she had done. She had absolutely no experience with police interrogation before. You don't say. And so when they talked to her, she wasn't always truthful. Her fear and her panic about what had happened led her to tell different stories. Throughout this trial, you will learn more about Jody Arias. Although not everyone in Travis's family were devout Mormons, all of them were close. He in particular had a very strong relationship with his sister Tanisha. And as you can probably tell, a picture can say a thousand words. Much more about Jody. You will find that she's an articulate, bright young woman who's a very talented artist and photographer. And so what would have forced her to have to take Travis's life on that awful day? In order to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. The bulk of the defense's opening was to paint Jody as the naive victim and Travis as the calculated villain. Being a temple member and an executive director of prepaid legal, outward appearances would be very important to Travis. And so while he continued this facade of being a good and virginal Mormon man, he was inwardly dealing with his own sexual issues. And in Jody, in Jody he found somebody who was easily manipulated and controlled. Someone who would provide him with that secretive sexual relationship that he needed. They also mentioned that Travis was violent with Jody on several occasions, that he would fly into these sudden rages for almost no reason, and that Jody was terrified of him. They end their statement with Jody's latest account of how Travis was killed, which is now a case of justifiable self-defense. The attorney gets to the moment Jody was taking pictures of Travis in the shower. Jody accidentally drops Travis's camera. And as that camera was falling, that was enough for Travis because he lunged at Jody in anger, knocking her to the ground in the bathroom where there was a struggle. Jody's life was in danger. In just under a minute from the, in just a minute from this picture, we go to the next picture where it's Travis's body, he's clearly injured already in a minute. Now that very brief moment of time, a minute is not the result of premeditation. In that one minute, had Jody not been forced to defend herself, none of us would be here. In that one minute, had Jody not chosen to defend herself, she would not be here. This is not a case of who done it. The person who done it, the person who committed this killing, sits in court today. It's the defendant, Jody Ann Arias. And the person that she done it to is an individual by the name of Travis Victor Alexander, a former boyfriend of hers, an individual that she was in love with, an individual that was a good man, an individual that was one of the greatest blessings in her life. And this love, well, she rewarded that love for Travis Victor Alexander by sticking a knife in his chest. And you know, he was a good man according to her. And with regard to being a good man, well, she slit his throat as a reward for being a good man. And in terms of these blessings, well, she knocked the blessings out of him by putting a bullet in his head. She took the knife and began to stab him when he was in that defenseless sitting position this is very important to take note of. The prosecution just referred to this, the last photograph of Travis alive. Their argument is that Jody either asked him to sit down or at least waited for him to sit down before she began her attack. She knew Travis had to be in a disadvantaged position before she commenced her assault. And the prosecution's argument is that it was at this moment when Travis received a stab wound to the heart. He would have then began to rapidly lose consciousness from that point forward. He attempted to protect himself and escape, but he was soon overwhelmed by his attacker due to the rapid blood loss. The pool of blood outside his bathroom reinforces the argument that his throat was cut after the stabbings. And a coroner's report, which will be revealed in more detail later on, concludes that Travis was in all likelihood shot in the head last. Jody's version, on the other hand, has to be that Travis was shot first. The reason for this will also be explained later on. And began and stuck the knife in his chest. He struggled. 
he grabbed the knife. And when he grabbed the knife, of course that resulted in more blood. I pushed the girl who was there, and I was able to get the better her, and I was about to run out, get out and go get some help, except that I was then confronted by the guy. This guy started looking through my purse. And lo and behold, in my purse, believe it or not, I happen to have my car registration that shows my address, because that's what I carry around. So they knew, they being the, this, this guy, knew exactly where I live. And he said to me, well, if you tell what happened here, the same thing's going to happen to your family. There's a different story now. Now, it's not that she wasn't there. Now, it's not that it's two people with whatever variation she may have provided to these national shows. Now, she admits it. It was her. She's the person who actually did this. And even though she says that, she still has a view as to the evidence. And this is exhibit number 248. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent. And you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. I also ask that you mark her words while you're marking the guilty verdict for her premeditated killing of Travis Alexander. Jody spent 18 days on the stand. When she knew what questions were coming, and when completely uncontested, she was very much in her element. She was able to respond to the questions instinctively, and her dialogue came out in a confident and natural manner. You could tell she had each and every one of her responses planned to a T, and had considerable faith that her manipulative prowess would ultimately save her. I don't know why, but they were Spider-Man and... At this point in the trial, the defense had already detailed how Travis was physically abusive, sexually overbearing, and a deep-seated pedophile. Jody stated that she caught him on his computer looking at images of children, and that Travis had even asked her to wear Spider-Man underwear during sex. The next segment is Jody's supposed theory as to why Travis had such a request. I, I do know, however, that prior, the year prior, he... There's a child he was close with that really liked Spider-Man. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but he was very much into Spider-Man. This is the reason why she never left Travis after finding out about his pedophilic urges. Um, I was under the impression that when he was able to sleep with a woman as opposed to fantasizing about a child, he felt like more normal as a, as a man. So, also, I had seen prior to this incident many beautiful qualities about him and good qualities about him and things that were attractive about him. And I believe that this incident was a negative part of himself that he didn't want to foster or that he was fighting or struggling against and that he ultimately wanted to eradicate. So just to clarify what she actually said, her understanding and support of nature was the reason she stayed in a relationship with an unashamed pedophile. She kept it a complete secret, hoping he would change, all the while he was being physically and emotionally abusive on a regular basis. She's tearing down his character, but trying to do so in a subtle manner. She gives off the impression that she's holding back on his detraction to preserve some of his reputation, when she's actually trying to destroy it as much as she possibly can. This is Jody's version of events that led up to the killing in her own words. It's important to note that when you rehearse something in your head repeatedly, it can be as though it actually happened. And as we know, Jody had nothing but time on her hands for the last four and a half years. The clip will begin at the moment she dropped Travis's camera. It's Slipped. It was kind of like the best I could describe it, like when you go to catch a football, but it bounces and you kind of fumble it a little because it, it didn't slip and just drop. It slipped and I tried to catch it and it kind of bounced a little and then fell on the ground and bounced and rolled onto the tile. It fell first on the mat, then it rolled right onto the tile. The mat isn't very big. It's just kind of right outside the shower. At that point, he got very angry and he stepped out of the shower. He lifted me up from the crouch position with enough force that my feet came off the ground momentarily, and he body slammed me on the tile. At that point, I rolled, and I ran down the hallway. I ran into the closet. I slammed the door. I start running. If you are looking at the diagram, it would be on the left side of the seat. I began running that way with my initial intent to probably run out this door. 
I instead went for the gun. According to Jody, a gun was hidden above the shelves in Travis's closet. She had discovered it a month earlier while cleaning. I grabbed the gun. Right, as, I don't, right about then, Travis was opening the door. I grabbed it. I ran out into the bathroom. He ran, I believe, straight toward the door as well. At that point, I had run out of the bathroom and I turned and I just wanted him to stop, so I pointed the gun at him, hoping that that would just make him halt. And it didn't. Instead, he lunged at me right around the time that the gun went off. And I didn't mean for it to go off. This is why her version has to be that Travis was shot first. According to her, it was all an accident. There was no intention to actually kill, and Travis's death was the unintended result of his own senseless aggression. So you might be wondering how she can explain the 27 stab wounds and the laceration to his throat. We got, we fell with a pretty good force down in the corner, near 15, but not quite a, that close. It was kind of near the sink, kind of sort of that area. And he fell kind of on top of me, but to my right. I didn't want him to get on top of me. He was grabbing at my clothes. He was trying to get on top of me. I don't know where the gun went at that point. It was not in my hands anymore. If it got knocked out of my hands or if I dropped it, what? I broke away from him. And as soon as I broke, the moment I broke away, that's when he threatened my life. Just to be clear on what Jody is talking about, after she accidentally shot Travis in the head, he wrestled her to the floor. But she then managed to break away, at which point he screamed the words, I'll fucking kill you, bitch. I'd have no clear memories after that. At all. It's things began to get really foggy after the gun went off. So there it is, her explanation as to why she slit the throat and continued stabbing the man she had no intention of killing is that she can't remember. The trauma of the situation caused complete memory loss, but she's able to detail how terrified she was right before her recollection goes blank. It's hard to describe the fear. Um, it, was, it was like mortal terror, it really was. Um, when he was trying to get on top of me, I thought he was, and then he threatened my life, I really thought he was had intentions to kill me. So. I don't remember sp any specifics of what happened right after that point. This is her explanation as to why she never called the police once she came to her senses, and also why she went to such lengths in order to cover up her involvement. I didn't want people to know the kinds of things that were going on in our relationship. I felt that if I told police Travis attacked me, I would have to give explanation as to why he attacked me. And if I gave explanation as to why, I would have to go back through the different incidents that we've gone through and how those things didn't really begin until after I walked in on him. I believe they were related and I didn't ever want to go there. So it was all convoluted and I thought that by saying that, that that would open the door to that, to that, to that. And I didn't want to de-edify him. So just to abbreviate what she said, it was all to protect Travis's reputation. The final strategy from the defense is to portray self-blame from the defendant. It's a subtle ploy to make it seem as though she's not even trying to appear innocent and thus give credibility to everything she had stated up to this point. Have you forgiven yourself for not finding another way out of the situation you found yourself in on June 4th? No, I think that if I had just left before any of that happened, I have a million regrets. I mean, I, I was scared of him and I reacted, but I still, re I will always regret everything about that. Do you blame yourself for not taking some other alternative measures? Yes. I think maybe if I had handled the gun properly and just, I meant to just point it at him. I thought it would stop him. And maybe he wouldn't have gotten as angry as he did. Maybe he wouldn't have threatened to kill me. I don't know. Ma'am, do you remember having a conversation with Detective uh, Flores of the Mesa Police Department back on July 15th of uh, 2008? Yes. And this was the day that you were arrested, right? Yes. What's fascinating about this prosecutor's approach is that the vast majority of his cross-examination doesn't even challenge Jody's new storyline. He simply asks specific questions within it. 
He puts a microscope under certain elements and lets the absurdity of it all speak for itself. And during that time, you told him something, and let's take a look at it uh, right now. Okay. I think you can help us. I would love to help you in any way that I can. Okay. That's not true, is it? Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on what help means. Yes or no? Were you there to help him? I don't know. Were you there to tell the truth? No. That wasn't the truth, was it? That you were there to help him, was it? No, that was not the truth. You'll notice that Jody has a hard time agreeing to details that actually conform to her own narrative. The tone of the prosecutor puts her on the defensive, and she tries her best to avoid agreeing with what he's saying, even though the actual context of his dialogue correlates with her own defense. And, in fact, you were there for a different purpose. You were there so that he wouldn't get the truth, right? No, I was there against my will. There's nothing that the detective ever did to get you to say whatever it was that you said at the first interview, right? Not that I recall. Well, again, we're with the memory issue. Ma'am, are you having problems remembering what happened back on July 15th of 2008? No. So he didn't do anything then, right? Anything what? What are we talking about, ma'am? Are you again having problems understanding yeah, what's going on? Your Honor, if she can't understand his questions, that's... Overall, to me, answer. I don't understand his question. Ma'am, the detective didn't do anything during the interview to cause you to lie, right? No. So with this interview, you then started to talk about whether or not you had been in Arizona, right? Yes. You said no, you hadn't been in Arizona, right? That's right. That's an absolute lie, right? Yes. And the reason that, that you didn't want to admit to being in Arizona is because you knew that you had killed Travis Alexander, right? Yes. Ma'am, after that interview, you then had another chance to have a conversation with Detective Flores the next day, right? Yes. And again, it was a voluntary conversation, wasn't it? Yes. And it was the same situation as the day before, right? He sat down, he asked you questions, right? Yes. That's when you changed your story, didn't you? Yes. Because you did not want any consequences with regard to the killing of Travis Alexander, right? I wasn't concerned about consequences at that point. Cross-examination on the actual killing started on day 39. At this moment, Jody has already explained that she dropped the camera, was body slammed by Travis, rolled away, and had just ran into the closet to get the gun. So then you just said that you were going over to the closet area to get the gun, right? The corner. The corner, right? And as you are in that corner, he's coming in through the door, right? Yes. But man, this is a very small closet, isn't it? No, it's bigger than the cell that I live in. It's bigger than what? It's bigger than the cell that I live in. It's not a small closet. Ma'am, we don't want to know where you live in. Do you understand that? I'm just using that as reference. It's not small. you understand? Did I ask you where you were living? No. We're clear, right? We do not want to know where you're living right now. You understand that? Okay, sorry. You run in, into the bathroom, don't you? Yes. You're in a hurry, right? Yes. You want to get away, right? Um, I want him to not get close to me. Well, you want to get away. That's what's going on, right? I want him to not get near me. That's what's going right. on. And so what you do then is, according to you, is you then go in here and then you pivot, right? Or turn around. Yes. You have the gun. Which hand do you have the gun up in? Both. So... Um, you have it out like this with both hands outstretched? Yes. Correct? Yes. And so you have the gun outstretched, and he's still not there yet, right? He's still in the closet. He's coming out the door as I turn. So he's at the door now, right? And according to you, he is on you when you shoot him, right? Not quite on me. I think the, the gun went off, and then he impacted me right shortly after that. And in fact, according to your testimony on direct, he falls on top of you, right? He lunges at me like a linebacker. Jody used this linebacker analogy a number of times throughout the trial. The prosecutor now asks her to give a visual example. It appeared to have no real tactical purpose, but it was certainly a welcome and somewhat comical distraction for the viewers at home amid the graphic testimony. Um, 
as he was no, running. No, no, just, just show me. That's what I'm asking you to do, not talk. Show me. Well, show me the linebacker pose. He got down and... Well, show me. Show me the linebacker pose. That's what I'm asking for you to do. Okay. He went like that, and he turned his head and grabbed my waist. Just like that, correct? Pretty much. And he grabbed your waist, right? I can't say it's just like that, but that's what I remember. Well, no, just, just, I want, without talking, just show me the pose. He got down like that? Like that. Yeah. All right, go ahead and have a seat then. After he came at you, ma'am, and he, that happened, did you go down? We both went down. And he's still not dead, right? Definitely not. He's very angry. He's very angry, and this is seconds afterwards, right? Yes. Is he on all fours now? Um, he's on the side of me, grabbing at my clothes and grabbing at me. What happens then? I break away from him, and he screams out, fucking kill you, bitch. And then what do you do? I don't really remember. I just remember... I don't remember anything at that point, so I would be speculating. So you don't remember a single solitary thing after that, right? The prosecutor for the next several hours would argue the improbability of that being the case. The memory loss caused by trauma would put Jody's mind in a state of disorganized chaos. Yet her next steps were highly calculated, as we all know. Even going by her own narrative, she knew exactly where to strike Travis with a knife in order to kill him. She also cleaned down the crime scene and deleted the photos from Travis's camera. This argument took over three hours to conduct and had to be explained through the scope of mathematics and science. On paper, it was perhaps the most damning part of cross-examination, yet it was so complicated that much of the testimony could have been lost with a jury. It was in fact the start of day 44 that had the most impact. It involved the time span between the two photographs taken on Travis's camera by accident. The prosecutor's argument is that Jody would not have enough time to carry out her version of events. He will first get her to recount all of these events in detail, and as she is doing so, will be oblivious to the prosecutor's closing argument. She will begin digging her own grave without realizing it. And it's important to note that all of what she is about to recount occurred in just 62 seconds. This exhibit, 161, is when the camera, according to you, actually hit the ground, right? I don't know if it's hitting the ground as that photo was taken or not. So you don't know how this photograph was taken then, right? It could have been while I was trying to catch it. I don't know. At some point, the camera hits the ground, right? Yes. That's what you told the jury, right? It hits the mat, yes, and rolls to the top. Ma'am, yes or no, didn't you tell the jury that the camera hit the ground near the shower? Yes no, or no, no. I said it landed on the mat. Is that near the shower? Yes. Is the mat on the floor near the shower? Yes. And the camera hitting the mat, would that be near the shower? Yes. And you then said that Mr. Alexander became very upset, right? Yes. And that, that's what started this whole thing out because he sort of stepped out of the shower and then came after you, right? He picked me up. That's coming after you, isn't it? And according to you, those movements culminated or continued when he grabbed you and put you down on the ground, right? Yes. And as a result of that, you said that you bumped your head or hit your head, right? Yes and that maybe it knocked the wind out of you, right? Yes. And that you were in fear at that point, right? Yes, very much. And that you were able to fight him off so that you could get away, right? Um, I rolled. You roll away and you begin to run down, run down the hallway, right? Yes. And then you went into the closet, right? Correct. According to you, that's where you went and obtained the gun, right? Yes. When you went into the bathroom, you were able to turn around, if you will, and now you had the gun in your hands, right? That's what you told us, right? Yes. And that's when he was coming at you in this linebacker pose, right? Around that time, yes. And that's when you shot him in the face, right? Um, yeah, that's when the gun went off. So then, according to you, he fell on top of you, right? It was kind of on top, but maybe more to the right. I don't know, it wasn't directly on top of me. I was trying to prevent him from getting on top of me. And that's when the memory issue started, correct? Right? I'd say that. Actually, ma'am, the way you describe that, it's impossible for the killing to have happened in that manner, isn't it? Objection, argument. 
No, that's just according to you. You'll notice that Jody evades the majority of the questions in this next segment. She starts to realize the argument put forward is making complete sense, and will at all costs avoid saying yes to most of the points laid out for her. It's as though she knows a fundamental part of her storyline is about to be exposed. We know that there's some action that is going on at 531.14, right? Something's going on, right? Yes. We also know that Exhibit 162 is 532.16, which is a minute and two seconds later, correct? Correct. So you've now shot him. You've told us that the fog is rolling in and that you have no memory. You still don't know where the knife is, do you? I don't remember a lot from that period. It could be... Right, but you told us before that period even that you didn't know where the knife was. Do you remember just telling me that? Uh, today, as I sit here, I don't remember where the knife was. On June 4th, I might have remembered where it was. do you remember a cross-examination that I asked you if you knew where the knife was? Um, June 4th, and you said, no, I, I don't remember where the knife was. And so as you shot Mr. Alexander, you by necessity then have to go look for the knife, don't you? I don't know the answer to that. Well, you didn't have the knife in your hand when you shot him. Yeah, That's, you did, did you? The stained. Did you have the knife in your hand when you shot him? It's the same question. Overruled. No, I did not. So, that means that if you didn't have the knife in your hand, you needed to go get it from somewhere, right? I guess. I don't know. No, no, no. There's no guessing here now. Uh, if you didn't have it in your hand and you just shot him and you're rolled away, right? Objection, argument. State. You do then agree that if the knife, if you didn't know where the knife was and Mr. Alexander didn't have it, it would take time for you to go find that knife, wouldn't it? Objection, argumentative. Overruled. I don't know. I don't know where the knife was. Right. Since you didn't know where the knife was, it would take time to go find it, irrespective of where it was, wouldn't it? Um, I guess under that theory. Sure, under that theory. It would take time, right? Yeah, I guess. And what you're telling us under your scenario, is that in 62 seconds, you get body slammed, you do whatever you do, but you get away, you run down the hallway, you go in the closet, you grab a gun, you back up, you shoot Mr. Alexander, he goes down, he's still pawing at you and saying, fucking kill you, bitch. And then, after you're able to get away, you go get the knife, and he ends up at the end of the hallway, all in 62 seconds. That's what you're telling us? No, that's not what I'm saying. And he didn't say, fucking kill you, bitch, till I got away. And Pardon? He didn't say, fucking kill you, bitch, until after I got away. You said he said it before I broke away, but he said it right as I broke away. She just created a non-argument for the purpose of deflecting from the primary contention. Whether or not Travis said those words before or after she broke away has no bearing whatsoever on the prosecutor's assertion, which he now reiterates. And then you had to go get the knife for everything to occur so that we got here. I don't know what's all the particulars of what's going on in that picture, so I can't even say if that's true or not. You might be thinking Jody has an argument here, that perhaps Travis was only shot and not stabbed. This would have given reason for the blood, and contend that Jody wouldn't have had to go looking for the knife. But the medical examiner found little to no bleeding at the site of the bullet track. The probable reason for this is that Travis was already dead. But there are also medical phenomena that could still prove Jody's narrative to be true. What she can't prove, however, is that this blood came from the gunshot. You say that he gets shot right? That's correct. Goes down and you describe for us that he's pawing at you and then you're able to sort of stand up, fucking kill you bitch, and then the fog rolls in, right? No, then I have no memory. The fog was already there. The fog was already there. And did you or did you not have the knife with you? I did not. And you obtained it at some other point? when you can't tell us, right? 
Uh, it would appear that way, yes. You say it would appear that way. Let's be clear, there wasn't anybody else there, right? That's correct. And you did stand out at some point. You remember telling us that, right? I believe I did. And when you stood up, he was still on the ground, right? I don't recall looking back. Pardon? I don't recall looking back. So you were, even though he's still a threat to you, according to you, and he's just threatened your life, you turn your back on the threat? Yeah, I'm trying to get away. This was the time she stated verbatim, the fog was already there. Yet when she feels threatened by a question, she all of a sudden has a vivid recollection. The element of the time span between the two photographs goes on for another 45 minutes. Yet the full context of the argument had already been asserted by this point, and perhaps strengthened by Jody's defensive posture throughout the entire exchange. When a battered woman is attacked, and they're defending their life, they don't know when to stop. Travis Alexander's body was stabbed 27 times. It may be that Jody Arias didn't know when to stop. This uh, individual, the defendant, Jody Ann Arias, killed Travis Alexander. And even after stabbing him over and over again, and even after slashing his throat from ear to ear, and then even after taking a gun and shooting him in the face, she will not let him rest in peace. But now, instead of a gun, instead of a knife, she uses lies. This is an individual who is manipulative. This is an individual who will stop at nothing and will continue to be manipulative and will lie at every turn and at every occasion that she has. Everything in this case points to the fact that it did not happen. There are no medical reports, there are no friends, there is no one that can come in and say anything about that. There are no medical records, there is absolutely nothing. There is a direct strike to his neck, which is an indication of somebody who is thinking, this person's not going to live. He may get away from me in the shower. He may get away from me all the way to the sink. And he may stumble his way down that hallway. But you know, I caught him. And now, rather than stabbing him anywhere else, right here. So it's a very well orchestrated kill. The other thing that she did is that she created a lie that really involves behavior that is a hot button kind of topic. How horrific it is to be accused falsely of being a pedophile. He's not here. He's not here to say, no, that's not true. And so State goes to the computer and doesn't find anything there. Oh, no, no, I changed my mind. It was actually images. First of all, her journal indicates that there wasn't such an event. Second of all, the text messages also indicate the same thing. And what human being, if that is the allegation, if they really are caring, what human being doesn't go to the police and say, or somebody else, this person is a pedophile? What she does, well, it's the new approach. It's the new approach to pedophilia. What does she do? Well, let's jump in the sack. That's what we're going to do. The State of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias, verdict count one. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one, first degree murder, guilty. Five jurors find premeditated, zero find felony murder, seven find both premeditated and felony. Um, just a couple of minutes ago, you heard the verdict from the jury. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I just went blank. Just, um... I don't know. I just feel overwhelmed. I think I just need to take it a day at a time. You, um, 
Did you avoid eye contact with Travis's family while you were in there, or did you make eye contact, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, I typically avoided eye contact. Travis comes from a family where they all sort of look a lot alike, so when I see their faces, I see Travis, and I see the man that abused me, and I don't want to look at that. It is ordered. The defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. Jody Arias is currently housed at the Arizona State Prison Complex. She maintains her innocence to this day.